Hi there, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. This is your scripture study class this year in the Book of Mormon. We point out things in the scriptures that we think you don't want to miss. That's why it's called Don't Miss This, in case you thought it was Don't Miss this. <laughs> We're missable. It's fine. It's not us. It's just the scriptures. It's kind of crazy how the scriptures have like, they're so old, you know? And like how songs get really old and you're tired of them. Yeah. Uh, but then they swing back around. But you know what I'm <laughs> so saying? Like true. someone does a cover of it or something, whatever. But it's just crazy to think how many, like, do you ever go into an old church and you're just so inspired by the fact that, think of all the people that prayed in here and all the people that have found God in here and all the people that have, their faith is, or hope has been reignited inside here. And it's just awesome that this same, these same books have been doing that for so many years. It's the same you know, it just keeps inspiring, keeps uplifting, keeps encouraging. People like have found so much courage and comfort and they have found home and they found God in these words and we're still passing them down. Yeah. We're still passing them down to our friends, to our kids, to our strangers and I don't know. It's kind of cool. And it's so fun. I feel like with the Book of Mormon this year, especially for me, is like teaching and watching people fall in love with it for the very first time. Mm. Like there's nothing that thrills me more than that is like watching someone's eyes when they discover the message that God had for them in the verse. And I'm like, how exciting that this is just the beginning of that. Right. For them. Right. Right. And it's just like, Oh wait. And like, it never goes away. Like that's what I always want to think is that I'm like, Oh, that's your first time that it became magic to you. But just so you know, that's going to happen a hundred million times in your life. Uh, right. Like I just had my birthday. I'm 43. You miss Woo. sending me a gift, everybody, but <laughs> Happy birthday. get my address to you. Uh, and I, and it's just like, I, I was thinking that same thing today. And I was like, <laughs> I have read, and legit, there's a joke in the world about First Nephi, you know, where it's just like, how many times have you read it? And you're just like, 50. How many more? 500 or whatever, you know? <laughs> You've seen that meme going around where it's like, you know, people are like, how many times you read First Nephi? And there's that guy like speaking to conference. He's like, more than 100? He's like, yep. More than 200? He's like, yeah. <laughs> But, but, and we're going to finish First Nephi today, so that's crazy. You because did it. Like we're done with the book. But For some reason, it really does. If you get past First Nephi, I feel like I'm like, like really wow, doing we're it. Making I'm it. Like, we're in it. Whoa. But, I've, you know, we've read, I've just read these words so many times, and it's just been just fascinating how, like you said, the magic can be there again and again. So, we're glad you're along with the ride for this. Sorry for that little, well, I don't know what you would call that. <laughs> we just like went into dreamland for just a second about it and just oh, getting and you let's excited just say this because we were talking about this uh, we've been talking about this together and we want to pass it on to you oh i'm glad i just said that because where's my phone i someone said something in church and i right when they said it i said read that to the don't miss this family and so let me try and find that but while i'm trying to find that talk about that what we what we've been talking about so that I can pay attention oh, to this. Okay, <laughs> yeah. The, the I, I didn't know where you were going, and so I was like, okay, can't wait to see what I'm going to say. Um, one thing, David randomly texted me this, and he was like, oh, what if at the end of every chapter in the Book of Mormon, you actually just stopped and said, like, what did I learn about God in that mm. chapter? And it instantly won my heart, and then I decided to start doing it in my seminary classes. Like, the last five minutes is reserved. Like, what did you just learn about God in this class today? And it has hands down become my favorite part. Like, it's just like, it wins me. And the reason why is it is a reminder after every single chapter, you could do it after every verse, you could do it after every book. It doesn't even matter when you do it because it's everywhere. But it's just this moment that's like, wait, this story is less about Nephi and Lehi and all of these people that we're so familiar with and way more about God. It right. just is. This is God's story, not theirs. Right, and, and they're not the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same yesterday, today, yeah. and forever. And so we'll get to that really famous verse today in chapter 19 about apply scripture to your life. And I just think one of the easiest and most powerful ways to do that is to find God. That's what we're doing as we track the tender mercies, you know, with, with this that we have every week. And we only do one. And we're just trying to like bring you in on the fun and say, do more than one. And this cute lady DM'd me and she said, I, on the back of these things, will write the tender mercies I saw in my own week when I put it on my poster. So what? that's a really cool idea. We have a spot in the journal. Wait, because then who wants to do this on New Year's Eve? At the end Eve? of the year. I yes, know, I know. the last Sunday of the year. I just go back through and right. read all of them. Goodbye. Right. 
Uh, we have a you spot can still do the... that even if you're four weeks in. It's fine, you guys. Yeah, start today. Yeah, start today. It's not too late. It's great. Um, there's a spot in the journal every single week to keep record of those two. So just, and what a cool thing if I were a teacher, if I'm just studying on my own, just to ask at the end, what did I learn about God in, in this? And to make a list. I almost did that for this little chunk of scripture, 16 through 22. And um, they're marked in my scriptures, but it would be cool just to maybe compile a list, put it up on the board if you're in a class. I don't know. Lots of cool stuff that you could do. All right, here's the thing. This is from back in 2018 when President Nelson said, turn your homes into a sink, like a learning. I don't, why don't I just read? But <laughs> <laughs> transform, I almost said sanctuary and I was right. Transform your home into a sanctuary of faith uh, and do that through scripture and any amount that you can or are able and, and it'll be an accordion, right? Because you'll have a busy week and less this week and more next week. But the promises um, that he made as you remodel your home into a center of gospel learning. I just forgot. He says, over time, your Sabbath days will, will become a delight. Your children will be excited to learn and live the Savior's teaching. And then this one was powerful. The influence of the adversary in your life and in your home will decrease. And mm -hmm. I, that one hit me like an arrow from the pulpit when this lady, my neighbor, read it, this prom these promises again. And it's just been several years, and it's like, why we do this? And then the last one is, changes in your family will be drastic, uh, sorry, dramatic and sustaining. And that's because we'll have invited him um, in. And oh, what, what did I, um, I just was listening to this song this morning. I'm going to put in the app somewhere, but this line was in it. This is it so good. It just became a, a kind of prayer today. It says, you're with us every hour. So fill this house with faith and resurrection power. And I just feel like one of the gateways to that is scripture. It just, it really is. And anyways, we, look at us. We just praise scripture for the first <laughs> several minutes. And now let's jump into them because um, we're just excited. Today's lesson we've called 16 through 22, God with us. You remember at Christmas time, that was the name Isaiah prophesied would be given to Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And um, we've just kind of talked about that, that, you know, when you look for what God has done in the pages of scripture, it's so much easier to see what he's doing in the pages of your own life story. And we just think this chunk of scripture is particularly, there's a lot of journey talk today. And in particular, we just learn a lot about a God who's with us on the journey every step of the way. And so we're going to see a lot of that today. And uh, we're excited to jump in. Remember, our segments are divided with this Read It, Live It calendar, the same schedule where we've, this is the, what the kind of, church gave us <laughs> for this week. And then we divided up the individual readings by day, if that's helpful for anybody. So day one reading is First Nephi 16. And it's interesting because when you think about that name for Jesus, God with us, it's such a clear way of seeing him. If you look at it in the New Testament, it's like, oh yeah, God with us. He's going to be walking in our streets. He's going to be coming into our houses. He'll be in our synagogues. Like it's easy to see him in that story as with those people. It's a little bit different for us, first of all, because he's not walking in the streets right now. And I think that's why I love the Book of Mormon so much mm. is because it's actually the same for them. He wasn't walking in the streets for it, the majority of this book. He hadn't even come to the earth yet. Yeah. They don't have that advantage of necessarily reading like stories from the past, ones that happened, places, you know. Yes, and I love that he really is the same yesterday, today, and forever in the sense that he was with them, the New Testament, and he actually is still with us, but he also was for the people before. Hmm. He still is with them, and he might show up in a way that is different than they expected. It's easy to see someone in the flesh and be like, yeah, they are with me, God's still going to show up, but it might look a little bit different. And what happens is chapter 16 starts, and it starts with a conversation between brothers and a little bit of bad news. And it's this moment for Laman and Lemuel where they're like, whoa, Nephi, like you just gave us like something that was really tough to hear. You spoke to us pretty clearly about right versus wrong, good versus evil, where we fell on that scale. And that's kind of a tough bit of news to get. 
-hmm. when you're sitting there and you're like, okay, yeah, maybe I'm not doing as good as people expect me to, as God expects me to, as I expect to do of myself. And they start out and they tell him just straight up in verse one of chapter 16, thou hast declared unto us hard things more than we are able to bear. We can't even begin to function. This is a lot. We can't do this right now. This is a lot of tough news. And it's so tender to me that Nephi instantly replies and he's like, wait, 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 listen. I knew that I spoke hard things. I get it. I'm the one that delivered the message and you might have thought I was like standing high and mighty, but no, I get it. This is actually hard. Repentance is hard. Changing your life is actually hard. I get it in verse two, he says, wherefore the guilty taketh the truth to be hard for it cutteth them to the very center. I know that this cuts deep. It might hurt your heart a little bit. And it's so interesting to me because right after he says, listen, we were willing to hearken to the truth and give heed unto it, that you might walk uprightly before God. You would not murmur because of the truth and say, thou speakest hard things against us. If you just listen, it might not be so hard. If you give God a chance, it might not be so hard. And, and, I, and let me just say this, because this is a word I boxed in verse three, and you find it in the sacrament prayers too, that if anyone feels like that overwhelm of verse one and two, the, there seems to be a simple reply in verse three, which is if you're just willing to hearken to the truth, start there. If you don't yeah. know where to begin and, a, and, and it feels like a life change is too overwhelming or the journey's too far, the very first step in verse three is a willing heart. Be willing to try. Anyways, that just really struck me this week reading. And it wasn't perfection that he was asking for. Yeah. By God, I'm saying God wasn't asking for perfection. He's like, listen, you just have to try this out. Yeah. Just be willing listen. to give this a be shot. Be willing to listen. And all of a sudden in verse five, they really are, okay, like, let's give this a shot. They did humble themselves before the Lord in so much that I, Nephi, had joy and great hopes of them that they would walk in the paths of rightness, of righteousness. Isn't that awesome how you go one to five happened in one column of yeah. scripture, right? And the only thing Nephi did, which I love, it's in verse, I think five, I just made four, is all he did was exhort. And that is such an encouraging word. Mm. It's not a mean word. He gave them kind of a tough truth. And then he didn't sit there and be like, yeah, you're still doing it wrong. He's like, no, actually, like you can do this. You can do this. Yeah. What All you cool have to do to is just out. be willing. Like you've got this. And then it's going to skip through and they're going to go through and they're going to get married. So exciting. Wedding bells. Everyone's excited. It's going to be better. They're all happy. And then in verse nine, all of a sudden, the Legit Lord just singing like love songs. My mind is like moving. <laughs> He's like, <"Whoa."> like moving. <laughs> they're dancing. They're having a good time. And then all of a sudden, Lehi, the Lord speaks to him and he says, listen, tomorrow you should take this journey into the wilderness. Hmm. It's time for you to go. And I kind of love that God's a little spontaneous to them in that moment. Like, I think that if it were me, I would have expected God to be like, Okay, in one week, get all your stuff, get ready to go. And God's like, tomorrow you're leaving, surprise. Like, yeah. hope you're ready to go. And it's so interesting because sometimes when God gives us quick direction, we feel like it's so spontaneous and unplanned and a little sporadic. But what happens next is he's like, listen, you're going to leave tomorrow. And then all of a sudden they get an Amazon Prime delivery outside their tents. <laughs> Just lucky you didn't know that they had that back then. And in verse 10, what's going to happen is the very next morning, he opens the door to his tent and he looks down and the, on the ground, there's a round ball of curious workmanship and it was of fine brass. And within the ball were two spindles and the one pointed the way whither we should go into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting to me that, yeah, it might've seemed like God didn't make that plan because he said, surprise, you're leaving tomorrow. God can be spontaneous and still be well thought out. Mm -hmm. He will actually plan for your journey. Even if it feels wild to you. And, and I think we should expect it. That yeah. if, the, if the command on the morrow comes into your, from verse nine comes into your life, plan a gift in the morning in, in verse 10. Just expect and anticipate that if the command comes to go tomorrow, that in the morning, the preparation is there. The gift will, will be there for you to do it. And I love the fact that I think this is the mo first moment for me instantly in the wilderness, the journey of the wilderness, that God says, I wish I could go with you. I wish I could be foot in foot. I wish I had my walking stick. I wish I could take that journey physically with you. But since I can't, I am going to show up 
but it's going to look like the shape of this ball that's going to give you direction. Mm. I'm still here. This is still my journey with you. I'm in the middle of it. It's going to look like this. Mm. And what's so cool. <laughs> I'm like asking in my mind right now, but I was—I don't want to spoil like anything where you might be going. I bet just that phrase you used, that the sh the shape of me in your story is gonna look like this. It just makes me want to ask that question. Yeah. You know, what's the shape of God in your story look like right now? Because He's there, and it might not what, look like His human body. Right. What shape is He taking? Yeah. And 100%. Yeah, does it look like this? Is it the shape? Is this, you know, anyways. Yeah, okay, well, should we just do that right now? Because it's so exciting. Oh, I'm sure. Going to. Fun, That'll yeah. be just fun. Because I love that from this moment forward, they get a gift on their doorstep. And from this very moment forward, they take it everywhere they go. And, it, and it's God going with them. Yeah, that's and it's not it's, because they like love the surprise. It's actually, they get to take God with them. Yeah. And that's been one of my goals for this entire year. I take this little book with me everywhere I go. And I love mine, it's like hand painted. And it's all my favorite places in the entire world. And everywhere, like I just am obsessed with the fact that every time I look down, I think, oh God went with me there. And holding this book, God is actually going to go with me anywhere I go right now. Yeah. And it's so fun to just have that with me. You know, know what I'm saying? Usually I'm a foam person and this year I'm like... Converted. Yeah. I'm like, I want this. I still, I'm 50-50. <laughs> yes, yes. But I really am taking this like all of, of the places. Oh, and P.S. I've gotten some questions about this and like this is not available. Grace has done a couple of DMs where to get something like that. But um, we have friends at, remember the people that recovered Emily's scriptures, the Alpine Custom Binding? Um, we'll put that in them in the newsletter so that if you're, they make little cute leather books like this or like different sizes of them in different colors. If you're interested in doing that this year too, by the way. Um, so we just thought that could be fun to, to show you, but we'll link to where they are and check our stories or something like that if you're interested, but, or just go and get a blue those small blue copies yeah. of them. And, and just... for me, there's just something about having one that you love. Like, I just love looking at mine and that just That's like insane. makes me so excited to take it with me. And there was one day, I think it was last week when I was like, I picked it up and I was walking with it. And I just like heard the spirit so clearly say, it. like it was this moment when I realized like, oh, I'm gonna take this book in the palm of my hands as a reminder of him because he has a reminder of me in his hands. Oh, and his sweet. looks like scars and mine looks like a book, but I want to be reminded that he is with me everywhere I go. Mm. And for Lehi and Nephi, they actually got the Liahona that they actually could just carry in the palm of their hands and be like, no, God is with me on this journey. Yeah, and I just wanna to say too, that like sometimes that looks like a friend and sometimes that looks like a parent, that yeah. you know God with you on the journey. And, and sometimes it looks like a patriarchal blessing. God with you on, on the journey. And I just, when it talks about that ball, which is so wild that it shows up, it's just like, what? But it's like a fine brass and curious workmanship. And I just wrote in my margins, God is a good gift giver and he'll provide you things that will connect you with him on your journey. And they'll, they might be curious, but they'll be good. They'll be fine and good no matter what it is that they are. And it will be something for your everyday. Yeah. Because that's how they used it. It was actually God being with them in the every day of their story. Because what happens in this chapter is it kind of goes pretty poorly in the beginning of their wilderness journey. And they start going and they're hunting for food and everything's going good until all of a sudden everything is not going good. And by 16, um, in verse 18, um, but verse 16 is really good, everyone, because it's all about how they followed the direction of the Liahona. And that's actually the tender mercy of the week. Oh, yeah. So yeah. don't miss that because it's so good that it's just like, oh, wait, actually every single day we followed his direction. Yeah. I just like 16 too, because you're going to be in the wilderness. Everybody's in the wilderness. Everybody's on a journey and mortality is a wilderness. Like we won't escape the fact. But God is willing and wanting to lead us to the more fertile parts of our wilderness. You, you'll still be in it. You'll still be in the grind of mortality. But he's going to take you to the places of, of beauty and, and abundance. Like that's, that's where he's going to follow, follow him and life can be sweeter and life can be sustaining and, and, and trials can be lifted. And just, there's something really cool about I led you to the better parts 
of life. And I just can't help but think that I'm gonna put this on while you're just talking. God was actually going to give them direction every single day. Yeah. And I can't think of a tender mercy from God that I need more in my life right now than that. Yeah. That if he is actually willing to go with them every single day and give them specific direction every day, oh, I hope that could be my tender mercy this week too. Mm. That every single day when I don't know what to do, I can actually just say, hey God, where do you want me to go? Mm -hmm. And what happens in the story is all of a sudden Nephi breaks his bow and it's kind of a mess and everyone's mad at him because now they can't eat. So if you've ever been hangry before in your life and everyone that knows me knows that I live in that if I do not eat, <laughs> you understand the story because everyone is so mad and they're all like, Nephi, for real, why did you break your bow? What's going on? And even his dad is mad. Like everyone is so, so mad at him. And what happens is all of a sudden um, you see this moment that he's like, okay, Everyone has hard hearts. I don't know what to do. And by the time you get to verse 23, there's this moment that he says, okay, I'm just going to build a bow. God's going to help me. I'm going to figure this out. I know that this is a disaster. I'm going to build a bow. And then I'm going to go ask my dad what I should do and where I should go. And there's something there that just makes me think that's a pattern I want in my life. When I don't know what to do, I want to stop and say, I'm going to work, I'm going to do my best, and then I'm going to ask my heavenly dad, where should I go? Mm. What can I do to make this better? How can I figure this out? And the Lord comes and he chastens the dad and he says, here, let's figure this all out. Let me find you food. We're going to figure all of this out. And there's this moment, they figure it out. He gets the bow. They start eating again. But there's one part that happens in verse 29 about the Liahona again. And it's this moment when all of a sudden he says, we actually kept getting more specific guidance from God. The more we used it, the more specific guidance we got, the more faith we had. It's this pattern over and over and over again that they're like, we are getting specific direction. And I love that it changed from time to time mm. because that means that God really was present in every step of the journey. And that's the mercy from this week. That's the mercy I hope for. I feel like that is the testimony of the Liahona is that God actually is with you in your journey from time to time. He will change every second if he needs to, if that's what you need, because he is present in your every day. Yeah. I think you want to, you can mark that in verse 39, that phrase, right? 29. Or, oh, and 39. Oh, surprise. 29 is awesome, right? Change from time to time. In 30, you have directions. Um, in, in 29, you have a new writing just to give you like words that describe that. But just that idea that we're talking about, I just saw in 39, the Lord was with us. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the, what they were learning from the lesson of the Liahona. Now, um, for chapter 17, your next reading is chapter 17, one through 30. And I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of lead out on two in a row, uh, here, what you want to do is the end of 16 and the beginning of 17 is a great place to do a little comparison of what happens. At the end of 16, um, Ishmael dies in the journey. And ain't, ain't that life, man. The bow breaks and everyone's sad. And it's like, they just turn, they just, and any kind of trial is so quick to turn our hearts against the Lord and each other. And, and then it gets solved and they're like, oh, okay, we're never going to be like that again. And then Ishmael dies and it's all back over again. <laughs> we're back at it. And this column in chapter 16, if you have like the regular scriptures, is a column I call um, maximizing trials. Where they go, just one bad thing happens and it is terrible and it's sad and it's tragic. But then they just, next things are just like, Ishmael died and, and we're all probably going to die and we're all going to suffer and, and we've never been happy and we never will be happy. And they just, they just, and it, P.S. The scriptures are when you read about some of these people, um, I wrote in my margin, um, you have permission to find this in yourself, not in others. <laughs> 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 this idea of like, when we see like a, like a characteristic of Laman and Lemuel, I, I, we have permission to look for and root that out of ourselves, not to like point fingers and find it in other people. Which I think actually has been one of my favorite parts of the scriptures this year is I have fallen in love with finding me in the characters mm. because they introduce me to parts of God that I specifically need. Yeah. And I think there's something so beautiful about the fact that sometimes I am the biggest complainer of all time. And I actually can learn something about God from Laman and Lemuel. Yeah. 
And I actually sometimes am like, I have been born of goodly parents and I have learned stuff from my dad and I actually hope I see the goodness of God in every day. And I want to learn about the God that Nephi had because I actually am pretty similar to Nephi. Mm. And the story has come to life when all of a sudden I'm them and the story is about God. Yeah, yeah. So chapter 17 starts with um, Nephi's approach to trials and he maximizes the blessing and minimizes the trial. So in comparison to what you see them doing, P.S. their solution for Ishmael dying was to kill their own dad. And you're just like, you you know you're in a bad place. If, like, <laughs> why, we're so sad our father-in-law died. Let's kill our dad. It's like that will not. <laughs> like, <whoa. laughs> just like hey. spins out of control. And in 17, they're taking their journey again. And listen to Nephi at the beginning of 17. We did travel nearly eastward from that time. And we did travel and wade through much affliction. Just so you know, wade is not a puddle word. Um, (laughs) They are in thick, deep affliction in the wilderness. And you're not getting out of it quick. Nope. Nope. Our women did bear children in the wilderness. That just one phrase there just (laughs) passes over. Like that's no big deal. And I just, if any of you have been a part of childbirth you know like in the wilderness is is it's a sad end of verse (laughs) one and look at what he says in verse two the beginning and so great were the blessings of the lord upon us this is actually our word for the week and something to hang up as a reminder throughout the week that verse one does not sound like the beginning of verse two to wade through affliction to have a baby on a rock next to a cactus does not (laughs) sound like what he's doing at the beginning of verse two and i think you ought to circle the word and he's not like diminishing the fact that things were hard things were hard and at the same time so great were the blessings of the lord upon us Blessings accompany the hard things. They don't necessarily replace the hard things. And so great were the blessings of the Lord upon us that while we did live upon raw meat, again, that does not sound like a blessing. He is in a place of mind where he has seen what is good about God and he's trained his heart and his eyes to see that because raw meat don't sound like a blessing to me. And the women were strong, like unto the men. That also does not sound like a blessing yeah. <laughs> to me. If you have to get me out there working so hard, I'm like. That just doesn't sound like a compliment or a blessing. <laughs> just like, you know, that the women were strong, like the men. You know, you're just like, ooh. <laughs> it's sort of what you. Like, I'm okay like this. Thank you. But it's this line. They began to bear the journeyings. They were given an additional measure of strength for the hard tasks that they were given to bear children, to raise children in, out in the wilderness. And I just think verse two doesn't sound like a verse that, uh, it's just not like when you put on a Hallmark card, (laughs) but it it is a promise that I I think um, mothers can hold on to, parents can hold on to, that you will be given the strength to bear raising children in a wilderness place. And he says in verse three, um, thus we see the commandments of God must be fulfilled. Listen to this. Here's a promise and mark the words. If it so be the children of men keep the commandments of God, he doth, he doth nourish them. He doth strengthen them and provide means. Those are words that are and words. The wilderness is hard and he will nourish you. He will strengthen He will provide means that happens twice in there while you are in your wilderness place. I put this little list here on the board if you're watching. I just think those are words that you just start to see what we talked about at the beginning. What do I see God doing? Here's just one column of scripture where you are doing that. So great were the blessings. Plenty. They were strong. They could bear. He nourished them, strengthened, provided, accomplished. They accomplished the task God had given them. He provided means. And then I just love in verse four, I marked many years, even eight years, that there's more happening day by day throughout those eight years where God is doing each of these things. Now, when Nephi, after he kind of goes through that that awesome spot of seeing the blessing, and how cool to have that poster up and talk about that, kids, me, whoever you're talking to, <laughs> let's 
look for the, let's maximize the blessings. Let's maximize our ability to see God's hand in a wilderness place. And how cool, even if that's the word of the week, to stop and be like, how is God nourishing me this week? How is he strengthening me? How is he providing for me? How is he helping me accomplish things? If that was the specific promise for them, why not us right now? Right. And I want to point out this. I forgot I wanted to say this. At the bottom of the Word of Week poster, there's a reference, a Bible reference. There's a Webster's Dictionary that gives you the idea of like, look for gifts, look for benefits, look for advantages. A wish of happiness? Look for a wish of happiness. What? All these are in a wilderness place. Look for a means of increasing happiness in a wilderness place. This is a solemn, prophetic benediction in which happiness is desired, invoked, or foretold. What a cool, that was the definition in Joseph Smith's time when the word was chosen. But number six, 24 through 27 is the cross reference. And we might not go to every cross reference on these posters, but this is one that is just like a tender one to me. It was a blessing that as the saints of the early Old Testament times would gather around the temple for their morning prayer, the priest would come out and bless this benediction on them, give them this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you um, and give you peace. It was a daily blessing given to them. And I just think it's neat as a cross reference here as that daily blessing we can look for of the Lord blessing us and keeping us, his face shining upon us, him being gracious to us and him helping us find peace in these wilderness places. So I forgot, I love that cross reference so much. It's one of my favorite verses of, of all time. I want you to compare a little bit of this. Um, again, when Nephi then talks about that, they get to um, verse six to the beach. And can you mark this line? They exceedingly rejoiced when we came to the seashore. Mark <laughs> that and then book yourself a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> to, and if you think the mountains the are beach. better, you never did yeah. that. You know, right. They didn't exceedingly Scrip rejoice when they saw a mountain. Scripturally, a beach trip is, listen, I have just given you scriptural permission to book yourself a beach vacation. Bless your family with that. <laughs> <laughs> In verse, verse six. Verse seven comes when they get to this beach, this place they call Bountiful because much fruit, much honey, all prepared of the Lord. You can mark in verse five. And it came to pass after I had been in the land of Bountiful for the space of many days. Do you like that God builds rest moments into the journey? The voice of the Lord came unto me saying, arise and get thee into the mountain. Arise, Nephi. I'm, I'm, arise to the next task. Arise to the next commandment. Arise to the next phase of your journey. And he arose. And in verse 8, he is told, you are going to build a ship. Thou shalt, thou shalt construct a ship. And then mark this after the manner which I will show thee. Whatever commandment God gives, he also promises accompanying instruction, direction, and revelation right built into the commandment. And then I've marked this phrase in verse eight, just as a side note, when I'm looking for what is God doing in these pages, that I may carry thy people across these waters. I love that imagery of a God who will carry you across the, the great waters. And there's something to me about the fact that the Lord spake unto him. And when Nephi asked about an everyday question, he said, let me bring you into my everyday God. I'm just not sure what's next. Like, can you just help me figure, like, I don't know actually how to build a ship. So can we go from there? And I love that if you invite God into your everyday, he will give you everyday advice. That's so cool. When the Lord is talking about this ship, um, Nephi kind of goes off on a little tangent here. And again, it gives you a peek into his heart because he asks, okay, where do I find ore so I can make tools, so I can cut wood, so I can build a ship? And he starts talking about building a fire. And he's like, P.S., it's the first time we've made a fire because in verse 12, the Lord didn't, we didn't need one because he said, I'll make your food become sweet. It's just this little like side blessing where he's just like, you don't even have to cook your food on this journey where you're like, whoa, what? <laughs> in 13, he says, I'll be your light in the wilderness and I'll prepare the way before you. I will lead you in verse 13 toward the promised land. And then this sweet promise, and you will know it is by me you are led. In verse 14, the Lord said this promise, after you arrive in the promised land, you will know 
that I, the Lord, am God, and that I, the Lord, did deliver you. I think that is so sweet that he says, I'm going to do things in a way that when it's over, you'll be able to look back or in the middle of it, as we see with Nephi, and be able to say with certainty, the Lord is God and he delivered me out of this and he carried me through this. You're, that you will have a witness at the end of this journey. You will have a witness at the end of this trial that will be one of your greatest treasures that you'll be able to say, and God carried us through it. And God led us through it. Here's what we learned about God. Here's where we saw God. Here's where we felt Him. Here's where He directed us through that experience. And it's something so interesting to me, I never even noticed until just barely, that Nephi asked for fire, which you use a fire, first of all, he obviously used it to cook food, and second of all, for light. That's just two things that you instantly need fire for. And I love that God said, not only will I show up to make your food sweet, but I will also be your light. And Nephi said, I need a fire. And God said, I will be exactly what you need. Mm. And I think there's moments in our life where we're like, God, I need fill in the blank. I need hope. I need peace. I need a job. I need help with my homework. I need help, whatever you want to fill in that blank. And I love that God says, I will be exactly what you need. I will come in the shape of a fire, in the shape of the liahona, in the shape of a tiny baby born in Bethlehem. I will yeah. be exactly what you need. Hmm. And then in the end, I just, that's so sweet. You'll be able to look back and, and you'll have a witness. I have witnessed your faithfulness is what you will say at the end of that journey. And I, I got this um, message from somebody who talked about a missionary coming home and this bishop, when he saw this missionary, just went and um, hugged him or her and then said, asked him this question, did you find Jesus out there? And isn't that oh. the sweetest question you've ever heard? Did you find Jesus out there? And then said this, I didn't need to hear the answer because I saw it in their face. And it, it just, I just love that idea of, if you're in a wilderness place, consider that question. Are you finding Jesus out there? And at the end of it, what is going to be your witness of, of him? Now, I wrote these verses because sometimes, do you see how Nephi is looking for Jesus and he's looking for the blessings? We saw in chapter 16, the opposite of that with Laman and Lemuel. And we sometimes see that in our own heart. And in verse 18 of chapter 17, you start seeing that again with Laman and Lemuel. Nephi comes out and he starts making tools. And, and verse 18 is sort of like a little commentary on humanity. It says this, they, they did complain against me and were desirous <laughs> that they might not labor. <laughs> <laughs> and, so true. And the reason is so because they did not believe. There was no motivation Belief is the fire that moves us forward into tasks that are too big for us. And they didn't believe. And they make this comment at the end of verse 19, where they says, you can't accomplish so great a work. And I'm sorry to make this list because I started to notice as they talked, they say, you can't do it. They said, our dad follows in verse 20, the imaginations of his heart. In verse 21, we could have enjoyed our possessions. We might have been happy. And I put in my margin a cross-reference to verses 49 and 51 in the same chapter. And I just want to jump ahead for one second and just notice where Nephi says, I, Nephi, said unto them in 49, that they should murmur no more against their father, neither should they withhold their labor from me, for God had commanded that I should build this ship. And if God had commanded me to do all things, I could do them. And there's the relationship between I. It, I come second. If he should command me that I should say unto this water, be thou earth, it should be earth. And it would be done. And verse 51 is just a fantastic question. This kind of sneaks into the next day's reading. <laughs> but I just wanted you to compare it and be able to see where the emphasis is, and maybe that's why they're responding the way they do in 51. If the Lord has such great power and has wrought so many miracles among the children of men, 
how is it he cannot instruct me that I should build a ship? And the journal, one of the journal questions is, is actually centered on that. Just to ask yourself that question, just to read that same verse. If God has done so many miracles and is so great and big and powerful, how is it he cannot instruct me that I should dot, 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 what? What has he? And, and, and what can you look to in, in the past? Where, what story of his can give you that belief that will, that will then move you forward into whatever task it, it is. But, so I just wanted you to see this blessing. There, where, was the, where was the focus in each of these? Now, the next day's reading is the second half of 17, and it's um, 31 through 55. And I'm, we're calling this one true and living. This is an interesting phrase because it's generally a phrase that we might recognize, if you remember the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants about a true and living church. I love that this is a title that is given to God. And um, it's even this right in line with what we're talking about today. A true and living God, a day-by-day God. And Nephi is going to talk to his brothers to try and encourage them by comparing their particular journey that they're on to the journey of Moses, a story that they grew up on. And this is the worksheet for the week as as well. And it kind of spans two of the days of reading. So that's why I'm (laughs) kind of doing this a little bit. Along the side, you'll see this question, what did he learn? And I almost want you to write in little letters underneath about God. And that's how I am using this worksheet this week and how I would suggest it. I think you could write on this worksheet all the lessons um, that that they learned, that that Nephi is learning from Moses' journey. But I think the most powerful lessons are going to be the ones that he learned about God from Moses' journey journey. Let me just show you. And he starts talking with his, his brothers in verse, I don't know where, 24, 23 and 24 about this Moses journey. And I think this is such like a, it's like an inception moment or like a little moment that you're like, whoa, what's happening? Because all of a sudden Nephi is going to stop and he's going to learn something about God from someone else's story in scripture. Mm-hmm. And I love that he's following a pattern that we get to follow too. Right. That all of a sudden he's like, no, I'm actually doing the same thing as you. Yeah. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to learn about the God I need from someone who was like me that needed the same God. Yeah. And it makes me want to stop and be like, I want to learn from someone like me about the God that they had because I need that same God. Yeah. yeah. And it's just so cool that it's like, wait, passing humans are on. the same. Just yeah, it's just on. like, this is the same pattern. Right. I heard the song this week and it has the phrase in it, Savior then, Savior now. Deliverer then, Deliverer now. And Nephi's learning that. And it's so funny because Nephi's like, let's look back on these stories. The same way you're saying we say, let's look back on Nephi's story. Yeah, literally. Right? And he had no idea. That's the cutest part is that I'm like, oh, Nephi never did that. We did the exact same thing that he <laughs> just did him. with Moses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in 23 and 24, for example, he talks about being led out of Egypt. And some of the verses in there, what I wrote on this was number one, that God led them out. Like that's, that's what he learned about God from Moses' story, that God led them out. And he led, there to some, led them to somewhere better. And he gave them a guide. He gave them Moses. Now Nephi can look back on Moses' journey and say, well, look at God did then. And he could compare it to his own and be like, wait, God led us out. And he led us somewhere better. And he gave us a guide, my dad. And the Liahona, you know, or whatever, as, as he's as he's. Going and why is through. it so cute that the guide's his dad, too? Yeah. You just want to pause and just love that. Anyways, it keep going. Cute. That's just so tender. So he just starts going through that. 23 and 24, he's talking about that. In verse 25, it says, he, he led them out because it was a good thing for them. And that's a phrase I want you to mark in, in there. And I would have written it on here that. And write it big on the side of your margin. That is the coolest part ever. Keep going. Right. And, and I did. All right. God is a God of good things. Why did he give, why did he take them out? Because remember, they'll, they'll get out into the wilderness and they'll say like, we miss the cucumbers and the leeks of Egypt, you know? And it's like, did you forget, uh, this is that idea, right? When a trial happens and you maximize trials and you're just like, you could have said, 
No, you, you were slaves. They were whipping you. They were beating you. Your life was not better in that place. And you see a pattern. Laman and Lemuel are doing the same thing. Where they're just like, our life could have been better in Jerusalem. I was like, want to bet? Read 2 Kings 25. Read about the destruction of Jerusalem. Read about them, read about them being taken with chains around their necks. Read about Zedekiah's sons, their eyes being burned out so the last thing they saw was the the death of their father like it wasn't better it wasn't but this happens when we maximize our our trials and and he's just saying he led them out because it was a good thing for them and and nephi could say the same about his journey and it makes me want to hope for the same testimony like i want to know a god that when he asks me to do something i am so willing to do it because i know his heart is good yeah. which means i know he has a good thing coming yeah yeah that's such a great phrase 26 they go through the red sea so he looks back on moses's journey and he sees the double miracle right remember the waters divide and they go through on dry ground that's what he's learning about god he's a god of double miracles he overcomes impossible things all like it was done by his word. He learns the power and the might of God's word from Moses' story. In Moses' story, he learns that they were fed by manna in verse 28, day by day in the wilderness. He learns that they were the, the water miracle. And I, that, that idea like that he led them by day and gave them light by night. This is in the middle of verse 30, doing all things for them which they needed. It says, which was expedient. That's what they learn in the wilderness. In everything, he was there. Nephi looks back at the story of Jericho and he learns that God made them mighty, it says in verse 32, and that he remembered his covenant. He also learned that he sees all flesh as one. I think in Rahab's story, you can learn that. It's like anyone willing to come under the protection of God is able to. Anyone willing to, to receive this grace, receive this might, receive this strength, can. He learns that from Rahab's story. He also learns from Moses' story of the snake and the staff. That people, it says in verse 41, he, meaning God, did straighten them in the wilderness with his rod. Even, um, and the Lord straightened them because of their iniquity. He sent fiery, fiery flying serpents among them and also prepared a way that they might be Healed. I love that God will straighten us. He will use the, the, the parts of mortality to correct our path. He'll point out our, our weaknesses and our sins. He'll do things to humble us. But he'll also prepare a simple way for us to come back. And as he looks on that journey, he then takes that journey and uses it as a lesson to teach his brothers. He says, we are the same. We are the same as them. Let's learn from the God of the past and look to that same God today. He's almighty, he says in verse 48. And then he says, you in verse 45 are the same as they were. You've seen an angel. You've heard his voice. He's spoken to you. But then he says, the problem is you didn't feel his words. You didn't let it into your heart. And I'm, and I'm, I'm exhorting you, let it into your heart. Let this God into your heart. And you remember, and then at the end of that is when that great verse we've looked at says, so if God has done all of these mighty things in the past, how is it he cannot command me that I can build this ship? or you put your own fill in the blank. I think that's actually the read it, live it for that day. Yeah, that same verse. Go build your ship, but look to what, who God is to give you the, to give you the belief and to give you the motivation to, to move forward in, in whatever it may be. And then there's that awesome part at the end where remember he shocks them and they, and they, and he shakes them. And I just think, I, I love that God will do that from time to time in my life, that he'll shock me and shake me awake. Um, and it makes me think of that, like that little medicine thing in ER movies, the clear, oh. that guy, <laughs> <I'll see. laughs> you know, because at the end of 55, they, it says, he says to them, they try to worship and he's like, stop, worship the Lord and honor your father and your mother. And those are heart words, worship and honor are heart words. And, and God was trying to shock or shake their heart back into believing again. And I, I love 
to believe in a God who's willing to do that, to just get, get me back, get my heart back um, in line again. Mm. So anyways, a lot we can learn from those journeys. The next day's readings come from 1 Nephi chapter 18. And there's something that calls my heart to this chapter so deeply because you do like this chapter starts with a moment that this family is actually just looking for something more. That's where this chapter starts. And I think I love it so much because there are several times in my life when my heart is hoping for something more. When I say, okay, I'm right here right now, but I just wonder if there might be something more. And that's what's going to happen. And they're building the ship. They're right in the middle of it. They're getting closer and closer. And in verse one, you find it. And um, it says, it came to pass that they did worship the Lord and did go forth with me. His brothers actually started and we did work timbers of curious workmanship. And the Lord did show me from time to time there it is after, again. yes, yeah. after what manner I should work on the timbers of the ship. And what happens is God is working with them day by day to get them to somewhere better. Hmm. He said, if you include me in your plans, I will show up day after day after day. I will work with you. And I love that he says, listen, in verse two, I would not work by the way that I had been taught my whole life. I didn't do things the same way. I didn't do what I had always learned to do. I actually decided to do things differently because actually I think we usually believe in a God that does things differently. Mm. And he said, I need to learn the ways of God, not of man. So let me figure it out. And he did build it after the manner of which the Lord showed unto him. And this verse number three, I think is the first step to that moment when he's like, I'm looking for something better. I'm looking for something greater. I'm looking for something different in life. And this is how Nephi begins to see it. And I, Nephi, did go into the mount oft. That's a good word. I would circle Mm. that. And I did pray oft, circle that again. And the Lord, wherefore the Lord showed unto me great things. His ideas, his dreams, his hopes came from the Lord. And he discovered, whoa, I'm <coughs> just joking. Getting emotional. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh. He actually discovered the great things through conversation with God. Hmm. And I think that that must mean that God saw greater things in Nephi than Nephi saw in himself. And he prayed and he said, God, tell me what I should do, what, how, who I should be, how I should build this ship. And God said, I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. I see greater things. Mm-hmm. And I think that in those moments when we're looking for something better, we're actually yearning for those greater things. And I have like in three C, foot, what's that called? Footnote, is that yeah. true? Mm-hmm. In 3C footnote, that you might want to just skip to that verse. It's really good, but it just has me like in the bottom of my scriptures. I just marked, this is what great things are. And that verse actually kind of goes through and lays them out. But it just says, these things, like great things are things that God can do, things that you can do working with God and what God will do in, thing, in like days to come. Mm. And I just can't help but think that when you, are praying to God, when you are conversing with God often, He is going to open your eyes to great things. He's going to show you what He can do. He's going to show you what you can do with Him. He is going to show you the plans that He has made, and they are great ones. Mm. And what happens is He starts and He finishes the ship, and I love that He just simply says, it was good. He's like, it actually was a good ship. Like, we didn't know that I could make a good ship, but it was good. Like, we made the ship together, me and God. And I love that it describes it as exceedingly fine. The workmanship was exceedingly fine. And in my scriptures on the side, I just wrote down, God's way is beautiful. Hmm. When God gives direction in your life, it leads to beautiful things. And it's not average things. And it's not things that are a little bit like, oh, what is going on there? God's work is actually beautiful. Mm, Amen. And the journey's not, the journey's messy, but what he does is beautiful. And so they get on the ship, they prepare all of their things. I love to imagine that, them like packing up their tents. I'm like, what did they prepare? What did they want to take with them on the journey? And um, everyone's in charge of different things and they get on the boat and they go. The journey to something greater, the journey to the things that God had showed me what he could dream about. They're on their way. They're going right that very second. And um, what happens is they get on the boat and they, in verse eight, I think this is so interesting. We put forth into the sea and were driven forth before the wind towards the promised land. 
And that makes me want to stop and just start wondering what that half sentence teaches you about God. Because for the first time in my life, I stopped and I was like, that must be maybe why God said, you got to build a ship that I tell you to build because I'm going to be the one in control. Hmm. And in my head, I was like, maybe they never had a sailboat before. Like, I was like, who, like, maybe God was like, no, actually, you need to build a sailboat. Like, who knows what it looked like? Yeah. But God was smart enough to say, build this kind of boat. And not only that, but God said, actually, let me show up like wind today for you. Hmm. Let me drive this boat. And they go, and it's interesting how quickly it switches because they finish the boat, miracle. You had to have acknowledged God was in that because Nephi was not a boat maker. And then the wind starts carrying them to the promised land. You have to acknowledge God is in that. And then all of a sudden by verse nine, everyone gets to be so happy. They're having a good time on the boat. And this line is so captivating that they did forget by what power they had been brought thither. They forgot about God. Mm. That's what that's what happened. And I think it's so interesting that the word rude is used right here. Yea, they were lifted up into exceeding rudeness. And it was one of those moments that I was not calling out other people. I was calling out myself. I sat there and I thought, I wonder if I'm ever rude to God. Mm. Because I don't use that word like in my life a lot. I don't like to think about me being rude to God. And then I had that moment that I was like, actually, I think sometimes I am. Mm. I think sometimes God will do a hundred million things and then I dance and I'm so proud of everything we accomplished and I forget about him. And that actually is rude. Yeah, and it's interesting that rude seems to be a relationship word. I don't know if it always yes. is, but it is like what you're doing is rude to another person. That's the problem with it. Yeah. Because it's not, does that make sense? Like yes. what you're saying, like I just, that's interesting. Yeah. And it's so interesting because Nephi starts to realize the problem. And he's like, listen, we got to figure this out. Like, this isn't going to work out for us. And the brothers get so mad that they take him and they bind him with cords. And um, it's so fascinating to me that it's like not like they weren't just like kind of mad. They were so mad that they like bound him in so much that he could not move. And it got to the point that the compass stopped working. Like, it was like not just Nephi couldn't move, but God also said, no, like, we all have to take a pause. This isn't working anymore. We need to stop for a second. And um, the problem for them, what they start realizing is that they don't know where they should steer the ship. And all of a sudden there's a storm that comes and that makes things even more complicated because it's not just like kind of a bad storm, but it's a great and terrible tempest. And they were driven back on the waters. So not only were they stuck, but they actually started moving backwards. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a little life lesson in that as well. That sometimes in our head, we're like, oh yeah, we'll just be stuck. It's not that, I'm just gonna be stagnant for a minute in life. It's not that big of a deal. I'm not gonna go forward, but I'm okay being right where I'm at. And it's interesting that when storms come, you don't stay stagnant. If you're not moving forward, you're actually going to go back. And they got so scared. And it's interesting to me, it makes me think of another time when people were on a boat and they got so scared. And I just can't help but make a connection to a moment on a ship with other disciples that said, wait, we are so afraid right now. This storm is bigger than we can handle. They were in the middle of a storm exactly like that. And they started realizing that they were about to be swallowed up in the depths of the sea, verse 15, which also reminds you of that story um, of the disciples on the ship and a crazy storm. And then all of a sudden what happens is everyone starts to hope, like, you got to untie Nephi, like, you got to untie me, like, please, please, please. And they don't, and they don't, and they don't. And in verse 16, Nephi says, nevertheless, I did look unto my God, mm. and I did praise him all the day long, and I did not murmur against the Lord because of mine afflictions. And it makes me think of that moment when they were all on the boat and they looked out the disciples and they saw someone walking and they thought it was a ghost and they were so scared. And then they realized it was Jesus. And that actually is what calmed their fear. Mm. And I love that Nephi also looked. There was something about both of those two stories and storms all around and fear in everyone's hearts. And the answer to both of the storms was looking to the Lord. I think that's a powerful lesson about storms. Yeah. And what's going to happen is they still don't let Nephi out and everyone's panicking. It gets so sad in verse 19 because 
all of a sudden his dad and mom get sick. And so then all of the kids are getting so worried about like, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive Jacob and Joseph? They were still young. They were like, everyone's, this is all falling apart. Nephi's wife is like, for real, like you have got to let him out. She is crying and praying. And she's like, what are we going to do? And then all of a sudden in verse number 20, there's this line that you can't miss. And you just want to highlight this so much. And there was nothing save it were the power of God. That's what they needed in the storm. That's what they needed in that moment. And when they saw that they were about to be swallowed up in the depths of the sea, they repented of the thing which they had done in so much that they loosed me. They looked back at God. They said, oh wait, actually, we need to look just like Nephi did. And Nephi got out and he took the compass and he figured out where should we go? Where should we go? And I prayed unto the Lord. And after I had prayed, the winds did cease and the storm did cease. And there was a great calm. And I just love that we believe in a God who calms storms. Not once, not twice, not just in Jerusalem and not just for these people in the middle of the ocean. It's actually a continual story for our God. He calms the storms and he is always there to look at. You can find him in the storm over and over and over again. In the end, they land in the land of promise. And I love the end of verse 24. It just makes me want to highlight so much. We were blessed in abundance. <laughs> Maybe not the abundance that they once had in Jerusalem, but a new abundance and still abundance. Yeah, and the people that were blessed abundantly is fascinating. That we, we were just in, in the, like a, this terrible relationship with God yeah. in one column over. And then it says they repented and he calmed the storm and he, and he started leading them again. And he didn't just start leading them again, but he led them to a land of abundance. That is a, the mark of God's heart. Like that's, that's, that's grace in its finest. Like we, we, no one deserved <laughs> the land he took them to after they were the way that they were the acting here. And there's, um, there's something sweet about that. And that's it's seriously one of those times that at the end of this chapter, you might just want to make a list in your margins of what you learned about God. Yeah. God doesn't hold grudges. Mm. God's still going to bless me abundantly. Yeah. God's going to set me free. God's going to be in the storm. Right. It's so good. Yeah, really good. Okay, we have two more days of reading that we'll, won't spend as much time on as, as the others, but let's just take a look at them. The next one is chapter 19. I put this in here so I could remember this. You might want to look back at that little tip in that you have at the very beginning because Nephi is going to talk about the plates again and the wise purpose that he has for the plates and making these small plates versus the big plates. And then some just things you might want to mark in verse 3, the plain and precious parts, the wise purposes in verse thing, uh, uh, in verse 3, sorry. And then end of verse 5, sacred things that may be kept for the knowledge of my people. And it just reminds me like to keep track of those things, the plain and precious miracles of God in, in my life, the wise purposes I see when I get to the end of journeys, and the sacred things so that I can keep them for a knowledge for my people. And I like that now he's going to say, this is kept for the sacred things. And then he's going to spend the rest of the chapter turning to the brass plates to look at the prophecies that were in the brass plates. And some of them we don't have in our current Old Testament. So that's how we know there was a difference somewhere in there. But he looks at the brass plates and the thing he wants to write about is Jesus and the prophecies of Jesus of, of Nazareth. And I just started to make a list here that you can see that, that as he goes through in verse eight, that he really is going to come to the earth in verse nine. I love this about the heart of God. Let me pause real quick in verse nine. That it says, people will judge him to be a thing of naught. They, they'll act like he is no nothing and they'll scourge him, but he suffers it. And they smite him, but he suffers it. And they spit upon him and he suffers it because mark this, of his long, sorry, his <laughs> loving kindness and his long suffering toward the children of men. You saw that character of Jesus in verse 18. Same, same, say, savior then, savior now, same, right? And, and then he, more prophecies that he'll come to the earth, that he yields himself. I love that it talks about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the mighty God of the Old Testament will yield himself when he comes to the world, that condescension word. He'll be lifted up, crucified, buried, and then he will visit 
And some he will have to visit with storms. <laughs> and some he will visit with the sweetness of his, of his voice. In verse 15, it says, we learn about him. He remembers his covenants. And he fulfills them years and years later if he has to. Verse 16, he says, I will gather people in. And I love what kind of people in 17? Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people will be blessed and will see the salvation of their God. And he says, I'm writing these things here in verse 18, that perhaps I might persuade people to remember the Lord, their Redeemer, what he's like, have a heart toward him. And verse 20 is so sweet. He says, I hold, I have workings in the spirit which doth weary me, even that my joints are weak for those who are at Jerusalem. For had the Lord not been so merciful to show unto me what happened, I would have perished with them also. Had he not led us out, and it just made me think, what moments do you have in your life where you're just like, oh my gosh, where you just get captivated and wearied to your bones with how good God is. And the story of Jesus does that for me every time, his story in the past, and then what I see for in, in the future. And then at the very end, he's just going to introduce, now I read all these things in the brass plates. I read a whole lot. In 23, I read so much in them, but that I might more fully persuade people to believe in the Lord, their Redeemer. I read to them Isaiah, which is why Nephi is going to start quoting Isaiah, and he's going to do it more in 2 Nephi. And I think you ought to know for two reasons. One, that they might more that they might believe in their Lord, their Redeemer, number one. And number two, in verse 24, that they might have hope. The intention of everything he's sharing is one, that people would believe in the Lord, the Redeemer, and two, that they might have hope. And those might be two things that you'll look for as you read all of scripture and maybe particular, and then in particularly some of the Isaiah chapters that he's going to quote. Beautiful. The last few chapters we're going to cover are going to be 1st Nephi 20 through 22, the end of 1st Nephi, which is absolutely crazy. I feel like that went by so fast. And he's going to begin in chapter 20 and 21. He's going to quote Isaiah. It's going to be Isaiah 48 and Isaiah 49. And it's so, I stopped before I like got into these chapters and I just decided like, I wonder why he chose these chapters. What did he need to learn from it? What did he want other people to learn from it? And that's what I actually looked for. I just like stopped and I was like, okay, why do you think he actually wanted to put these in? Because he had to rewrite them, you guys. Like, it's not like he just like copied and pasted. Like, it wasn't like this was yeah. easy. It wasn't like a cop out for the book. He actually thought it was important to be written twice which I think makes it vital to me. And at the top of chapter 20, I just wrote, for me when I'm not listening. And at the top of chapter 21, I just wrote, for me when I feel forgotten. And these two chapters seem like personal letters to me and to you and to whoever else is reading in those two moments. And chapter 20 starts, and I love, this is why you're not listening. He says, hearken and hear this. He's like, listen, for real, you got to start listening. And what's going to happen is he starts going through and he says, in verse five, and I have even from the beginning declared unto you, I have told you my plan from the start. Mm. I showed you, I have showed you over and over and over again. And all of a sudden in verse six, he's gonna say, thou hast seen and heard this. You have evidence. I know you know, you have felt that. You have experienced it a hundred million times. And in verse eight, yea, from that time, thine ear was not opened. I have been telling you a hundred million times and you might just keep not listening. That mm -hmm. is me over and over and over again. I'm guilty and my mom will tell you that's true for her and usually sometimes for God too. It's okay, I'm working <laughs> on it. That's why I have chapter 20. But and then, then I just like what you we're talking about, like then what do you learn about God from that? He's yes. not three strikes, you're out. That he's not like, okay, well if you're not, he's not petty. He's, no. Like you said, he doesn't hold grudges. He's like, I keep trying to get through to you. Yes, and it's so cute because listen how good the next verses are. Nevertheless, for my name's sake, will I defer mine anger that I cut thee not off. Mm. You are mine. Mm. I will tell you over and over and over again because you are my kids. Um, for behold, I have refined thee. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. I will not suffer my name to be polluted and I will not give my glory to another. He will do things only he can do. So you know it's him. 
He will show up in ways only he can. For I am he, I am the first and I am also the last. I have laid the foundation of the earth. My right hand has spanned the heavens. I am the one who started this whole story and I am the one who will finish it. It's me and I will tell you a hundred million times and you just guys have to go through this whole entire chapter because there are things over and over that you're gonna love. And in the end, he just says, I, the Lord hath redeemed his servant, Jacob, and they thirsted not. He led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He claved the rock also and the waters gushed out. And um, notwithstanding, he hath done all this and greater also. Ooh, that's a good phrase. 22. Yes. And greater also. The very end. And maybe if you're in that moment that you're like, I'm not listening to God really a lot lately because I'm busy or whatever, fill in the blank. Maybe you want to go find the message for you in chapter 20, but maybe really fast if you want to look in 21, it's so good. If you are feeling a little bit forgotten about, this chapter is for you. And even from verse number one, all ye that are broken off and driven out, you that are broken off and scattered abroad, who are of my people. You are mine. You might feel lost. You might have feel forgotten about. You might feel far away. Every you time are he says mine. the isles, I think that. Because sometimes you feel like an island. You yes. feel like separated. So every time that phrase comes in scriptures, that's what I think about. Like I know he's probably yes. talking about all the islands of the earth, you know, but, yeah, like, but sometimes you feel too. like an island. Yeah. Yes. Far away, it says. You people yes. from far. Yeah, and he says, listen, O isles unto me, the Lord hath called me from the womb. That's you, from the very beginning, this is still true. Mm-hmm. In verse number three, thou art my servant in whom I will be glorified. I have labored in vain and I've spent my strength for naught and, my, and in vain. Surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. What, like, I, I don't even, I'm not seeing any fruits of my labor. I think I'm forgotten about, I don't even know what's happening. And but look in, at that promise in three. And you who are forgotten, through you, I, my name will be glorified. What I'm going to do in your life and what I'm going to do with you is going to cause people to believe in me and cause people to praise me because of what they see happening through and in you. So like, hold on. Good things are coming. Greater also. Yes. And I love that he's like, it might seem like it's nothing, but it's not. Mm -hmm. I promise that it's not nothing. And verse number five. That, and now saith the Lord, that formed me from the womb that I should be a servant to bring Jacob again to him. Yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation until the ends of the earth. If you thought I forgot about you, I actually from the very beginning of time have had a work for you. I have something big in mind for you. Mm. You go through and the more you see, the more you're like, oh my goodness, he actually has never forgotten me. There might be a verse in here he wrote just for you to remind you that he did not forget about you. I actually just really believe that. In verse 13, it gets so exciting. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. O mountains, for they shall be smitten no more, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his inflicted. And all of a sudden, it might seem like the Lord has forsaken me. You might be saying that God forgot about me. God left me high and dry. Verse 14, but he will show that he has not. He will show you that he has not. You have to go through this whole entire chapter because every single thing that you see. Keep going because 15 and 16 are your your best ones. I know. You can't (laughs) even help it. You You guys are going to die. When you feel forgotten, look what he's going to say in verse 14. He will show you that he has not. For can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Can a woman forget her very own baby that still needs her to eat? That cannot even survive without her? Then he says this. You're like, no. You're like, no, she can't. Then he's going to change your mind. He's going to say, yeah, actually, they might forget. You're like, what? No way. Yeah. And then he's like, no, for for real, like even the least likely person to forget someone they love might. But you listen here. Yet will I not forget you, O house of Israel. I will not forget you, for I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Mm -hmm. The person who is least likely to forget you on earth might but I will not. Mm. My hands are evidence. What I have done for you is evidence. The reminder is in the palm of my hands. I cannot go a day without thinking about 
you. You might feel forgotten, but I have a reminder of you on the palm of my hands. That's a verse for the people that feel lost, for the people that feel left out, for the people that feel forgotten. And you just have to go through the rest of the chapter. And all of chapter 22 is just Nephi summarizing it. So if you just need a little bit reminder in the end, you're like, okay, which one am I? Let me find a verse for me. You will have it. But I just love that Nephi said, actually, here's two chapters with reminders specifically that maybe he needed, maybe he wanted to share with other people, and maybe he wrote them just for us. Yeah, yeah. That 22 is just like Nephi saying, like, see the big picture, the big redemption story with the scattering and the gathering of Israel, which is beautiful to see, starting in Moses' time and coming into ours and like just the big span of events. But then remember back in 1923 when he said, but liken them also to you. Yes, see God in the grand span, like how he, you spread the heavens with his hands, Isaiah says. See him working through the whole story of history, but make sure you see him working in your story. This is how he is with the house of Israel, but don't forget that you're a part of that. And that's how he is with me and you. God is big enough for eternity and kind enough for every day. Oh, whoa. That's the best way to end. <laughs> right, hey. that in the end. Yes. That was hey. the first Nephi. Man, and we'll see you next time for second Nephi. God bless.